Hello my friends, it's the Game Boy Geek here. Today, we find ourselves in the Game of Thrones universe in the realm of Westeros, where you'll take on the role of a mighty house with your eyes set on the illustrious Iron Throne. Tiny Epic Game of Thrones is for one to four players. It takes about an hour to play. The age on the box is 18 plus since it uses the Game of Thrones license, but it's suitable for the normal 14 and up age of the Tiny Epic series of games and is published by Gamelin Games. Now in this video, I'm gonna be focusing on the base game, which is a competitive game. But in the campaign, there is an expansion available called Tiny Epic Game of Thrones Ice and Fire. Now it completely changes the game into the first Game of Thrones board game that can be played cooperatively as you and your compadres try to take down the Night King and his army of White Walkers. Now, Tiny Epic Game of Thrones is being crowdfunded right now, so I'm going to show you how the game works, and I'll see you on the other side. This is a crowdfunding preview, so all the art and components here are prototypes, they're not final components. So to see all the most up-to-date art and components, check the link in the description of this video. Now to be in the game, you're going to be able to select one of these houses to be your house. And each of the different houses come with a hero, and they're depicted by miniatures. Now House Aaron and three of the ones that weren't selected will be available to make alliances with later, possibly using their hero or their power tokens in the future. So each player is going to take their hero and their house card, and they're going to be using this to manage things throughout the game. So at the beginning of the game, Westeros is created by a map of these cards, and these are made up of different domains. Like, I was the Lannister, so I start here, has my little token here, the little shield, and I get to start with one power token there and a leader. Uh, I also have a castle. This had a castle, and this is important because you're trying to essentially control domains with castles in them. Because the game is played over six rounds. Now, over these six rounds, scoring is going to happen at the end of the third round, the end of the fifth round, and the end of the last round. Now, scoring, one of the, the main ways to score are to see who has the most castles controlled. So, for example, in a four-player game, uh, you'll get four points for having the most castles, three, two, and then one. Now, castles are controlled, and you start with your own, but you're going to be going, marching around to different domains and possibly taking over other castles and having the most control in those areas, controlling those castles. Now, during scoring, another way to score are your goals or objectives of your house. Now, those are specific to you, and over the course of the game, you're going to be recruiting these power tokens, putting them out in the domains on the map, and as you unlock everything that's above it, like this says, now, if I control Castle Rock at the time of scoring, I'll get a point and things like that. So as you, you know, there's different goals there. There's all sorts of different goals, like controlling two fief domains or three fief domains or King's Landing. Now, fief domains are the ones that have little coins on them. They're good for those points during scoring, but they're also good because they're going to give you gold during sort of the end of the round when you go through taxation and such. King's Landing's here. It's great to control that, but you need to control at least three castles in order to even get there. So there's some longer-term strategies as well. Now, of course, you're going to be fighting for alliances with these other non-player houses, and for each one that you have an alliance with, you're going to get a point as well. So those are some of the main ways to gain points during scoring. Now, there's other ways to score points during the game, not necessarily in scoring, like certain card events are going to lie. You're going to have some plot cards in your hand, and over the course of the game, you're going to be able to play these for some of the events, like gain a point and three coins if you have no alliances, or pay three coins to gain one point. You can do that up to three times. You're also going to be gaining points for winning battles and other ways during the game as well. Now, at the beginning of the round, the dice are going to be rolled, and now one player is going to have the hand of the king. They're going to be sort of the first player. Now, you're going to go through dice drafting, but it's going to start with the last player of the round, meaning the player sitting to the right of the first player, and they're going to draft one of these dice to keep, and then they're going to pass the rest, again, counterclockwise. Now, this is going to happen, like let's say here in a four-player game, where the first player is going to have two actions to select from. The one they don't select, let's say they selected this one, will end up going to this player. So you'll always have an action that you kind of sort of draft at the beginning, but you also will get a second option based upon what other people don't select. Now, that was for a four-player game, and there is slight variance to that in a two- or three-player game, how that works. Now, let's just say I was the first player, and I have these two dice to select from. Now, I can select one of these, and I will then place it on any open spot here. Now, these actions are basically all the same actions that are here on the dice. So, for example, this is a march action. This is a recruit action. 
I could take this die and put it on any open spot. And if I do so, I am going to be the only one to do this action. And then I'm going to do this action, but then everybody else can follow this die action. So maybe I want to march and then recruit. And then everyone's going to recruit. Or maybe I want to recruit and then march and then everyone else is going to march or something different. So the timing and the order that you do this is very important. Sometimes you're picking dice just to clog up spots because you don't want other people to be able to do those actions based upon the state of the board. So there's a ton of strategy of which die you pick and where you place. But let's say I pick this. We're gonna, I'm going to recruit, then I'm going to march, then everyone else can follow if they want to. So here I'm going to pay some money to place up to two units. Now you can see how much it costs. Like this one here just above it, it costs one. This one also costs one, but now next time I do a recruit, if I want to take one of these, it's going to get more and more expensive to do so. Now, you're also, as you're doing that, uncovering possible goals. Like if I got this one out later, I'd be able to possibly get this goal as long as everything above it is clear. During scoring, I'm going to be getting these. So putting, uh, getting these power tokens out is great because it's going to give you control on the map, but it's also unlocking possible goals. It's also unlocking uh, different things that you'll be able to get during the end of the round when we go through taxation and stuff like that. Now I showed you that to show you the differences in cost as you go through units, opening up different bonuses. But in this case, we're actually only going to recruit one of these. So in this case, we're going to spend the one gold. So we're down like this. And that's because in each domain, you can only have three units from the same house. Now, this is the one we started in here. And let's just talk a little bit about uh, strength here. The hero is two, and each of these power tokens are one. Now, if we were defending this, because there, this is a castle here. It's actually on our board. The castle gives us a plus one. So if we were defending here, we would have two, three, four, five there. So when I recruit it again, you have to go to a domain that you control. So again, I put it here. Now, when marching, you can move up to two domains away with your army. Now, I have these three units here. I'm going to leave this one back to sort of keep this castle defended. So I'm going to take my hero and this and move it. Now, you can go up to two away. You're moving adjacent, so this is one. You can pick up and drop off if you want. So if I had one here that was already there, I could pick it up and take it up with us, or I could drop one of these off and keep moving. But in this case, I'm going to, I'm going to keep moving with both of them. But you could drop these off because you might want to control one of these fiefs this shield islands because again it's going to give you some money during the taxation at the end of the round but let's say we go to here now you can't move through a place where enemies are so you know if we were going through here if there's any other units we we basically have to stop now in this case we're gonna we went through here and we came here and we are going to battle here now let's take this look here they have a two three and because there's a castle here that's the four and we're at two three so we're down by one here because we wanted to leave this person defending our castle because we want you know we wanted to have that defense there now when battling there's a lot of table talk above the table going on where you might be talking with other players about hey what, what are you going to be doing let's go attack the you know go over there attack don't attack me i won't attack you there is a lot of alliances going on with the players as well but when you're battling the attacker has a chance to put a face down card to add to the strength of them and the defender also gets to decide to do that. And so in this case, let's say the attacker, uh, they, both, they both put cards down, the attacker did this. Now the attacker is going to look at this value. Uh, this is a four. They're going to add it. So remember, they had two and three total, because this is worth two, that's worth one, and then this. So they had two, three, plus four is seven. They are at two, three, four, right? If the defender had played this card, they would have only been at a six, because it would have been two, three, four, five, six the attacker would have won. But notice there's no cost underneath this, so this defensive card did not cost that other player anything to play. That's probably why, want, why they want to play it. Maybe they didn't have any gold. But if instead that defensive player played even this, this would have costed them one gold. It shows how much defense, uh, how much it costs for this defensive card. And this would have been three. So now they would have been at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And the attacker would have been at seven. If it's tied, the defender would have won. So that's one you might want to play defense. And you can even see on this card, if this was used for defense, it's two coins to get to a four. And so the more defense the card has, the more it costs. So you can look at how much gold other players have when you're attacking them and know what's the most they'll be able to defend with. Now, there are different uh, things that can happen with some of these defensive cards, like this one would be, hey, they draw the top card off the deck and they use that as defense. Or maybe they're using the strength from their adjacent domains and things like that. But in a basic way, that's how battles work. Now, winning a battle is one of the ways to get points in the game. Now, let's have the attacker one. In this case, this player would have to lose their hero or their power token. Now, if they took that power token back, they will get the reward on the map for a constellation. So they would actually get a gold for bringing this back. However, they could have brought their hero back here. In this case, they would have gotten a point and two gold. However, 
their hero card needs to be now out of their hand and down until they recruit it back. And the recruit cost is three by taking a re recruit action and getting that, that hero back. And then they need to retreat uh, to, the, to the closest sort of friendly domain. And you may have noticed on their map, their castle was gone because, because we took their castle over, we are placing it here. And again, most castles are going to be getting your most point, a lot of points at the end of the, and, and when scoring happens. But of course, the more castles you get, the more upkeep it is, which means your gold sort of maxes out at a smaller amount. So it's an interesting balance of, of that. So again, we did recruit and then we did march, but now everybody else in turn order is going to be able to follow this and march. They're not forced to, but they can. After that, the die I did not select again is going to get passed to the next player. Uh, and then they're going to be able to select from the two dice, the one they selected and the one that was passed. And this continues on until, you know, this is pretty all gone here, all full. So let me just go over some of what all these other things do. Now, sailing allows you to take an army and allow it to move to a, a, a domain up to two cards away. So from here, I can move this army to this card and to this card down here because that's two away and they could kind of come in here and, you know, try to take over this or try to go into one that's not there. Same thing for me. If you were here, you could go, you know, go up two cards or you could go come down around two cards. You just can't go around the top of the map there. So sailing's just a way to move faster, but you can't pick up and drop off armies like you can when you march, but you can go further. Another action is event. You can take a card from your hand and play it for its event, like perform up to two recruits or lose a point to max out your coins or perform a march. This is called a force march, moving up to four domains instead of two, including through enemy domains, which you normally can't do, to start a battle and gain two uh, plus two for the battle. So those are events. The cards are always going to have different things that you can do. And that's a big part of the strategy is managing your hand because you're thinking of the events. You're thinking of the amount of uh, uh, additional offense and or defense that's there. You're also going to be thinking of these shields, which is going to be having to do with another action that we can talk about now, which is plotting. Now, when plotting, let's look at some of the non-player houses here, because remember, you can make alliances with them. Now, let's say this was the card I was playing as plot. I can use these shields to help me plot. Now, for example, this one has to do with this house, so I could spend a gold and get one of these uh, power tokens from here and put it on my board in the ally pool. And this is important because uh, I'm trying to build up enough of these to be uh, have an alliance with them. Because at, if I have at least two of these, and at the end of the round I have the most of them, I get the shield from them, and that means any uh, power units from this uh, specific house on the board acts as if they're mine, which is huge in this game. Also, once you have the shield, then when recruiting, I can actually get the hero from that house along with their card that I can use with that hero. Now that could be huge because at the end of the round, if I have the alliance with them, guess what? I'm the one that actually gets this castle, which again was, could influence uh, lots of things in the game, defense and points and all sorts of things like that. Now, you, you saw me use this to get this one. If this is my own home shield, which it is, I could spend, instead of one gold, two gold to take any one of these. Now, I, want, I might want to do that to start fighting for another alliance, or I might want to fight for this to start keeping the alliance that I've already gotten, or maybe that would have been used to get the second one that got me the shield in the first place. But when plotting, let's say I have a card that has the shield of an, an, an actual opponent that's playing. I could spend three gold to take any one of them off their ally pool and put them on mine. So I would spend three gold, they would not get that money, and this would go onto mine, and that could really change who's going to get the shield at the end when you check for alliances. Now the last action I haven't talked about is Whisper. It looks like this. Now you can discard any number of cards. Let's say I don't really like these, they're not really fitting my strategy. I can discard any one of these. I gain a gold for each card, then draw up to the maximum of four cards. So you could do this when you're low on cards just to get cards, or you could do it to get rid of cards that you aren't really using to get money, and then get up to your maximum of four cards. And once everyone's taken a turn, we go through the end of the round. We're going to do taxing. So you're going to uh, check alliances. So again, if we have at least two and we have the most, we get the shield. This is when the shield might pass to someone else. If you're tied and you have the shield, you keep it. But if the two people tied don't have the shield, it's the one closest to that first player that has the hand of the king. So you're going to be checking alliances for, th for different things. And this is going to change who owns what on the board, like immediately. Uh, you're then going to call your ally pool, so you're going to reduce down so you don't never have more than two. They go back, if you do, they go back to the, the non-player house's map there. You're then going to gain coins. So we're going to look here, and I'm going to get one, uh, two coins, plus I'm going to get coins for different fiefs that I control. For example, I control this fief, it's a coin, but guess what? That's my alliance, I have the shield, I control this as well, that's another one. Now you're also going to be getting plot cards. In this case, I'm going to get two of them. Now, you can never have more than the max of four, not counting your leader card, uh, your hero cards, uh, but that's pretty much it right there. 
And if you happen to have owned the uh, King's Landing and had the Iron Throne, you'd also get an additional two coins. But remember, you can't even control that until you have at least three castles, like I do here. And assuming you played your hero card, you'd pick it back up into your hand. Then we would move this to the next round. Now let's say it was the end of the third round when this happened. We're gonna move here and then we're gonna do the score. Remember, we're gonna look at see who has the most castles. You're gonna get points depending on whether you're in first, second, third, or fourth, or depending on how many players, how many castles, if you have the most castles. Then each of your objectives, you're gonna get one for. So right now I have unlocked both spaces above this and this. So I'm gonna get a point for if I control Castle Rock, which is my home uh, domain. And if I have two dom thief domains, which I did, I would get another point, for example. Each alliance that I have, I have one shield, so I'd get another point. Now, whoever has the least amount of points at this point gets this Vengeance token. This means that anytime they start a battle for the rest of the game, they gain a point. Which means at the end of the fifth round, we go through scoring again, and the player who has the least points gets Vengeance. Which means it was this, if it was the same player, they're going to get plus two battle for the last round. So again, at the end of the fourth, at the end of the third round, at the end of the fifth round, at the end of the sixth round, there's going to be all of the scoring. And of course, I showed you many ways you can score during the game, and whoever has the most points at the end is the winner. Now, there's a lot more rules I didn't go over. This is just a high-level overview, but there's a few things I did want to point out. So obviously, at the end of the round, you're going to be taking all these dice up. The first player is going to go clockwise and going to roll a dice, redraft again. But also, each house uh, has its own special. So I can always set a die to an event phase, for example, and all the houses do different things like that. Uh, but then, at a nutshell, at a high level, that's pretty much how you play Tiny Epic Game of Thrones. And before I leave, I'm just going to show you a few more cards here. You can pause and read these, the popular Red Wedding card. Uh, so you can stop and pause these if you want, or also check the link in the description of the video. The Kickstarter project page uh, will show you some more art and components. Well, there you have Tiny Epic Game of Thrones, and with the competitive base game that I just showed you, and the cooperative expansion Tiny Epic Game of Thrones, Fire and Ice, you can now play a Game of Thrones board game in the manner that suits your game group that day. Now, if you'd like to see the most up-to-date art and components and all the different pledge levels available, you can click the link directly below me in the description of this video. Now, that's going to take you directly to the crowdfunding page, and I'm sure that Gamelin Games would love your support.